in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews this morning. Every time I get ready to preach, I wish I could read this whole chapter before the message, but I'm sure you're familiar with it by now. And our message is going to take, take up at verse 15 through the 17th verse. I'm going to just read these four verses, or three. Trust that all the background will be fresh in your mind. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And since this message is about Esau, I'd like to turn back to the book of Genesis and read just a few verses about the story of Esau. I believe in Genesis 25 is the story of the sale of the birthright. Genesis 27 has the account of Esau's bitter weeping. In Genesis 25, verse 27, it reads, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Esau, or Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint, that is, he was tired. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am tired. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In the 27th chapter of Genesis, we have the afterward. Afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing. His father is dying. And at his father's death, Esau is to come into the full and complete blessing of the firstborn. But he had sold his birthright, a thing he had forgotten. And in the final day of accounting, when he was called before his father, he found that he had missed the great opportunity and privilege for which he was born. In verse 34, it says, When Esau heard the words of his father, that is, giving the blessing to his brother instead of to him, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob, for he hath supplanted me these two times? He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him, and what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And a sorrowful picture. As I was reading that story, I see how perfectly Jacob fulfills the type of the flesh who continually supplants us who seeks to destroy the blessing and privilege which is ours. The 12th chapter of Hebrews has to do with the Christian race. We're not racing in order to get to heaven. It has to do with the blessing of how we get to heaven. And once in a series of messages on eternity ahead, I tried to emphasize the, the glorious truth. It's a mystifying truth, but a glorious truth. That somehow, in some way, we who are believers are are making now and molding now our appreciation and our enjoyment of heaven. There's been so much emphasis on heaven as a place that seems like a trifle that, as to how we arrive in that place. It seems like the object of the thing is to get there. But getting there is not just the point or the purpose for which we were saved. We were saved to be conformed to the image of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the place where we're headed, and we're going to hear about that in a couple of more messages, 
is not nearly as, port, as important as how we get there and, and what lies ahead of us at the end of the race. So the Christian race is not to see who, who gets to heaven and who doesn't. It's to see how we get there. We are given the privilege, we are given the blessing of having our own lives to live for Jesus if we will. At the end of the race, he, he offers crowns. I've heard Christians really make light of these crowns and say, what's the difference if I get to heaven, whether I have any crowns or not? But heaven is not our destiny, though we shall be there. Our destiny is to be like Jesus, to see him as he really is, to know and love him as he desires to be known and loved, but important to me in the manner in which I desire to be known and loved too. So the crowns which are mentioned in the scripture are spoken of as of something that's far and beyond the, the mere fact that we're saved. There are five of them mentioned in the scripture. For instance, the crown of righteousness, which Paul said would be given to him in that day because he loved the appearing of the Lord Jesus. Now all of us have righteousness if we're saved. God's righteousness is Christ himself and he's been given to us by faith if we're Christians at all. So we're not going to get righteousness if we run the race well, but we will have that righteousness crowned in a very special way, which I can't describe to you this morning because I don't know. And the scripture also speaks of the crown of life, yet all of us have life. If we have Jesus at all, we have eternal life. But he promises that those who run the race and run it well will have that life crowned in a very special way something far and beyond the ordinary possession of life. And he mentions the crown of joy. And yet all of us have joy. And when we get to heaven, all of us are going to have joy, more joy than we have now. But still, Jesus promises that to those who run the race well, there will be a special crown on top of that joy. Something above and beyond the mere possession of joy. The joy will be crowned, glorified, and honored in a very special way. And not just for a moment, but for all eternity. Then there is the incorruptible crown, which was promised to faithful shepherds. And I always rejoice in that word incorruptible, because it will be the only thing the shepherd ever got that didn't fade away after a little while. It's an incorruptible crown, and yet all of us are destined to be incorruptible. In the day when Jesus comes at the last trump, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, the dead are going to be raised and they're going to be changed and the mortal will put on immortality and we which are corrupt will put on incorruption. So we're all going to be incorruptible when we are made like Jesus, but there's going to be a special crown above and beyond that state of incorruption. And last of all, there is the crown of glory. Yet all of us are destined to share his glory. All of us are going to be glorified when we see Jesus, every one of us. But there is a special crown above and beyond that glory which we shall share with him. And these crowns are, are what he wants to give us. And I can't explain what they're all about because it's too spiritual for me, too wonderful for me. But yet in heaven, I see that these crowns have a very special place. And in the book of Revelation, when the saints are finally gathered there at the feet of Jesus, all these crowns are cast at his feet. Nobody wears them. We've never put them on our brow and walk around heaven with them on. In fact, I don't believe that we're even going to know who has them. It's the man who has them that's going to know. And he casts them at the feet of Jesus. And it's him and Jesus that know how much the crowns cost. I don't like to use that phrase, but it's a true phrase. Because Paul said in running this race, we have to contend and we have to strive and we have to do that lawfully. Can't cut any corners. Can't change direction. Nor style of running. You must run as he has directed us to run in the direction he has given us in the manner in which he has taught us, by looking unto him. When I was first saved, that scene in Revelation 4, 
where the saints of God come at last before the throne of God, and the sea, the sea around it is glassy. And they're assured that all pain and sorrow and heartache and the trials and tribulations of life are over forever and ever. And they're clothed in, in garments which are white. It's not their garments, but it is the manifestation of God's righteousness in Christ. And they're given harps, instruments of praise. And each one has a pitcher. And in this pitcher are the prayers of the saints. So we're going to meet our own prayer life in heaven again. And whatever's in the pitcher is what we put there. And this pitcher, which contains the prayers of the saints, is being continually poured out as an incense offering to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout eternity. And upon these harps of praise, or these instruments of praise, men are singing the praises of the Lamb of God. But there are also those who have something to give Him. And these things are simply called crowns, and those who had them came forward and laid them at the feet of Jesus and said, Thou art worthy, thou art worthy to receive all honor, all glory, and all praise. And it's far more blessed, Jesus said, to give than it is to receive. So if you have something to give in that day, you will be far more blessed than those who simply receive. So somehow, with all the understanding that there is in the Scripture that a little mind like mine can get hold of, it leaves me with a distinct impression that earth is an opportunity to gain something for eternity. And that my life now can be invested in some eternal return. And that what I spend my life on now is definitely going to affect my fellowship and my joy and my blessing in the presence of the Lord Jesus when I see Him. I'm not teaching any different, different degrees of heaven. We're all going to be in heaven. We're all going to be in the new Jerusalem. We're all going to see Jesus. We're all going to know Him and love Him and appreciate Him and enjoy Him. You know, when you think about the Apostle Paul, Nobody but Jesus and Paul knows what it cost Paul to be what he was. He, he enumerated some of these things in his, in his confession to the Corinthian church when he talked about his sufferings, for instance. He told about how many times he'd been beaten and starved and thumped around and left in the ocean to drown when he was shipwrecked and all these various and sundry things that had happened to him, his imprisonments, the awful hatred of his brethren, the way he'd been persecuted and afflicted and tried and tested. And then he listed on top of all of these afflictions which he endured what I consider to be his chief affliction, and that was the worry or the concern or the care, he said, of the churches which came upon him daily. He was never freed from the sense of responsibility and the worry and the burden which he carried around in his heart for the saints of God. But only Paul and Jesus know about these things. Paul can name them, but they don't mean that much to me. Having never been beaten with rods, having never been stoned and left for dead or shipwrecked a day and a night in the deep, I hardly know exactly what he experienced. It must have been bad. But Jesus knows, and Paul knows, and the wonderful thing is that Jesus knows and Paul knows that he didn't have to. Because there was Demas who turned away from the very life that Paul lived. Fascinated, Demas was, with the challenge of life. Demas didn't return to the world because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Had he done that, he would never have been a Christian. For he who loves, who loves, with a gopus love, the world itself, has no love of the Father in him. But Demas wasn't attracted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Demas was attracted by the challenge of life. And that's a rather lofty phrase, so I'll break it down for you. What attracted Demas was the possibility and the right to live his own life the way he wanted to live it. Just be what he wanted to be and do his thing. And for the moment, that seemed more important to him 
been traipsing around all over Europe and Asia after Paul, suffering and being persecuted and afflicted and hated. And so Demas took the short view. And he said, now is what's important. And he turned aside and he turned away, so only Paul and Jesus really know what it cost him to stay on a job, if you let me use phrases like that. But in that day, there will be something between Paul and Jesus that never passed between us. Right? One look into the face of Jesus and what fills Paul's heart, I may never know. And when Jesus looks upon Paul, I may never know what fills his heart when he sees how much of the sufferings of the body of Christ Paul filled up for Jesus' sake and how the suffering which he endured he prayed down upon himself by daily praying that he might know Jesus and share in the fellowship of his sufferings and those two things are inseparable. And Paul counted life's greatest challenge as an increased knowledge he said of Christ Jesus my Lord. So, I think you can see that there's enough in the Bible to testify to what I tell you. It isn't a matter of getting to heaven. All will get to heaven who are saved and who have trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. What's important is, first of all, how we get there, and secondly, how we enjoy it after we get there. Because we have this privilege now of taking our lives and enhancing our eternal fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this chapter is really all about. It's about the race, the race of the Christian life. It has many hindrances. We've been hearing about these hindrances, the, the things that weight us down and keep us from running. The sin which does so easily overtake us. The contradiction of sinners against us. That is, the mockery of the world for wasting our lives in such an existence when there's so many more fascinating things out there to do. We've been hearing a lot about the hindrances, but there's also every kind of help offered to the believer. There's first of all the, the tremendous encouragement of chapter 11, all of these witnesses that now compass us about. These who were men of flesh and bone and blood just like me, definitely stated of Elijah, one of the great prophets, of the Old Testament that he was a man of like passion the book of James says man made up just like me and so when you read the stories in chapter 11 you should be encouraged these were men just common ordinary men Daniel was no superman when he went into the den of lions he went in scared to death like any man would go Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were no supermen they didn't have asbestos suits when they went in the furnace of fire they were men just like us who who hurt and went into the fire anyway because the outcome of their lives with God far more important than the pain of the flame for a moment. So first of all, here's the encouragement of the witnesses, those who come to us about, those who continually whisper in our spiritual ears and say, hang in there. We made it. You can make it too if you really want to. Keep running. Don't quit. Stay with it. Fight one more round. Here's the continual assistance of these witnesses. But above all of that, there's the fellowship, the encouragement, the help of the runners themselves. We're not running alone. We're running together. You and I are running. And I'm helping you or I'm hurting you. I'm hindering you or I'm helping you on your way. There's the encouragement of the runners. It'd be a lonely, lonely race if there weren't anyone else out there, you know. We come here every Sunday morning. We come here every Wednesday night to the hall in Vienna. And many times when nothing else helps me, I'm helped by just walking in the hall and seeing that there are other people running. And they're all worn out just like me. And they've been in the race too. There's something there that encourages me about that. So not only are we encouraged by the witnesses and encouraged by the runners themselves, but best of all, we are encouraged by Jesus. 
And the, the longer you remain on this earth and walk with the Lord, the more you're going to know the truthfulness of what I'm about to say to you. But the only way any of us are going to make it in any kind of situation in life is to look to Jesus. This is the victory and this is the key and this is the way. Not only to look to him as an example because he ran and ran through much more, diff more difficult times than we will ever run through. He was, he was attacked in more different ways than we shall ever be attacked. He suffered much more of the contradiction of sinners than we shall ever suffer. He endured much more pain than any of us will ever know and he was hurt far worse than any of us shall ever be hurt. Not merely looking to him as an example then because he made it through the race too, even though he did make it as a man, son of man, dependent upon the Holy Spirit as we are to walk too. But not only are we to look to him for strength and help and grace, but he is, after all, the author and the finisher of whatever faith is in us. And we are to look to him in total dependence, in a desperate realization every day of our lives that we're in need and he's the only one that can help us. And then there's the chastening of the Father. The Holy Spirit to continually remind us of the witnesses whose rest is already won. The Holy Spirit to continually work that spirit of encouragement and fellowship among the living saints. The Son of God to encourage us from his place at the right hand of the Father. And the Father himself to guide us and correct us and rebuke us and straighten us out by his chastening hand. So there really isn't any excuse for any of us not making it. But yet in this chapter, the sorrowful note here at the end of this teaching on the race is that some won't. I don't mean some won't make it to heaven, but some will quit in the race. Some will not run as they should, and they're described as those who, who fail of the grace of God. And this is one of the first blessed things I know to tell you about the race this morning is that those who, who fail do so because they fail. They fall short. They drop back. They fade away from the grace of God which is offered to them, available to them. So what's really being said here is that no man need ever fail in this race, all the grace of God is available to us. So when we're not making it and we're not running as we should, it's because we are not appropriating the grace of God for our lives. Now that's important because otherwise we get the idea that only, only the strong are going to make it. And, uh, and only those who really strive and really bend every effort and really contend and really work at it are going to gain the crowns. But it doesn't have anything to do with our effort, our tireless efforts to run the race. And it doesn't have anything to do with our continually staying at it and contending and striving and agonizing. It has to do with whether or not we avail ourselves of the grace that's open to us to make this race. The race can be run very easily and handily, but it must be run in the power of God's grace, which is in Jesus again. And yet here in this chapter, I'm told that some are going to fall back from that grace. Now, these are not unsaved people. These are saved people who quit running. These are saved people who, who fail of the grace of God. And it's a terrible thing that happens in a man's life when he fails of the grace of God. That very statement alone is one of the terrible things that happens to him because he is continually convicted and beset with the guilt that the grace was available to him had he wanted it. The responsibility is placed directly on him. That it's Not that he can't make it, it is that he, he won't make it. It's not that things are, are too hard for him. It is that he refuses to look to Jesus for the grace and the strength to make it through those hard places. He fails of the grace of God, and when he does... There is something down inside of him like a root buried in the ground. It may never have bothered him before, but this root begins to express itself, and it's called a root of bitterness. 
It's a root of resentment. It follows his frustration of being overtaken by the sin of unbelief and sitting down with all of his weights in the race of life and saying, I can't go on, and that isn't so. It is that he's really saying, I won't go on. And this bitterness wells up within him because of his realization of what he has done. He has done deliberately and willfully. And when this root, when this root begins to come to life, it springs up. And if you'll think about these phrases, you'll see that Paul's, he has a picture before us of some root that's been in the ground through the winter and now the spring sun has come and the rains and makes his presence known and begins to spring up. Oh, we walked over it for years and years and didn't even see that it was there. But now suddenly it's, it's seeking a place of prominence and it's going to have its day. And the more we notice, the more we notice that it's growing. This root of bitterness is springing up now. And uh, when it bears its fruit, according to this passage, its fruit is two things. Trouble. You read that? Trouble and defilement for other saints. Now, I know you'd like to believe that how you live your life is your business, but I wouldn't have got it were that way. And if the way you live your life is your business, that is, it's nobody's loss but yours, it doesn't affect anybody else, what I do, that's me, you know, and that's between me and the Lord. That's the way all Christians like to think, because it's precisely how your flesh thought before you got to be a Christian. I used to say over and over and over when I was unsaved, look, my life is mine. I can live it as I please. I will be what I want to be. And nobody can make me do any differently because my life is nobody's business but mine. And my flesh still believes this and still has this same philosophy. And he'd like to make me think that as a Christian. Everything in the scripture is opposed to it. One simple reason makes everything in the Scripture opposed to it, and that is that when you were saved, you got married. That's the word, because in Ephesians 5, speaking of the church in its relationship with Jesus, it is likened to marriage. And the Scriptures plainly state that when you were saved, you were joined, that is, you were married, you were glued to the Lord Jesus. Well, he said, that's you and Jesus. But Jesus is not off here by himself, and you and Jesus have a little thing going. Jesus is the head of his body. So when you were married, when you were joined to the Lord Jesus, you were joined not only to the head, you were joined to the body. Bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and members one of another. And the scriptures teach that no member of the body of Christ can be filled with sorrow, but when that sorrow is known, other members of the body feel that sorrow. You agree to that? <clears throat> so you want the bennies, don't you? <laughs> and when you're joyful, one member of the body is joyful, what happens to the other members of the body? They're joyful too. When one member of the body is strong, and that strength can be sensed in others, that strength is also infused in others, because we're all joined to each other. And in Ephesians 4, it says it's like joints. Joints of the body supply and what each one can supply for the health and edification of the other. Now this is one of the great doctrines of the New Testament that I don't like. I haven't liked it for years. I, I've never liked it since I became a Christian. You know why? Because I don't like to be responsible for somebody else's spiritual welfare. But I'm stuck with you. And you're stuck with me. And you can hurt me or you can help me. And I can hurt you or I can help you. And if I sit down in the road of life, if someday I say, okay, I'm not going to avail myself of the grace of God. I know I can make it if I want to. But it's not that I can't make it. Now I'm saying I won't make it. And I'm not going to make it anymore. And what I do is my business. And that doesn't affect you. That isn't so.
because that will be like a big root. Right in the middle, not simply of the assembly, but right in the middle of the body of Christ. And this root of resentment and bitterness inside of me, because of my own spiritual neglect, will begin to spring up. <clears throat> the ugliness of the flesh is something that can't be hidden from Christian. And let a Christian be overtaken with bitterness and resentment, and he makes his presence known among the saints. Do you believe that? You know where I learned that? By observing the life of this man. Because when you're bitter and you're resentful, the first obsession you have is to prove to everybody that this bitterness and this resentment isn't justified. And, and there's only two things that can ever come out of that. When, when a man fails of the grace of God and he doesn't run like he ought to run, and he becomes filled with resentment and bitterness because of it, he springs up, that is, he begins to seek recognition among the other saints and the only thing he ever gives them is trouble and the fruit of that trouble in their lives is defilement now, I told you before that when you, when you quit running you're in the way and, and people are going to stumble over you and if, and if they make it over the top of you and don't walk all over you as they go and if they do get around you without stumbling over you to their own downfall, they will at least be slowed down in the race and hindered from the time it takes to get around you. Because, you see, we don't see this race as clearly as if we were sitting out here in the stadium and the runners were running round and round like the guy did in the Olympics, you know, the train for months and months and then fell down on his first try. But we were watching all of that on television. We say, the guy fell down. And the guy tripped over him and fell. He said, the big dummy, why didn't he go around him? But we don't see the race that easily. This is a spiritual race. And I may appear to be running when I'm not running at all. And you may appear to be running when you're not running at all. And before you are smart enough by the discernment of the Holy Spirit to find out that I've quit in the road of life, you may have stumbled over me considerably. Because my bitterness and my resentment will work trouble for you. And I, this is a doctrine I don't like. I don't like it because the one thing that makes me more weary than anything I know in my life is the weariness of remembering this very truth. What do you, what do you mean weariness? Well, because I don't like the responsibility. I'd like to be able to say that I could quit any day I wanted to quit. That I could stop running any day I wanted to stop running. And that's between me and Jesus and the rest of you people. You'll just have to do what you can do and do it the best way you can. Now, I could do this if I could get out of the body. But I can't get out of the body, and so my unspirituality is going to affect you, and my bitterness is going to rub off on you, and my resentment is going to work trouble in you. And the trouble that I bring to your life will defile you spiritually. And the first thing you know, you're going to be reflecting my bitterness. And Esau is the man who has given us a great example of this. I'd like to tell you about Esau because he's a man every Christian I know about. What was his claim to fame? He was a great hunter? No, but he was. He was a man of the world, a man of the field. Jesus said the field is the world, he said in his parable. That he was a man of the world, sharp operator, a hunter, an outdoorsman, just the opposite from Jacob. Jacob was a housefly type of fellow. He just hung around the house and him and his mother had a thing and you know what kind of guy Jacob was at that time in his life. He'd done the cooking. <laughs> so while Esau was out in the field hunting, Jacob was home cooking chili. <laughs> That's exactly what he's cooking. Right? It was a red soup made from a red bean. And I don't know whether Jacob was Mexican or not, but it was chili. 
<laughs> so Jacob was home here. He's cooking a big batch of chili. He said, oh, I'm going to make a big pot of chili today. And Esau was out in the field. He said, I'm going out and hunt. Well, what was his claim to fame? Well, his claim to fame in the spiritual presentation of Esau's life in the scripture is that he was the firstborn in his family. And that phrase itself brings out the tremendous responsibility that Esau had to the rest of his family, to his father, and to all around him. Now, I'd like to explain what the firstborn means. It doesn't mean uh, due to the time or the accident of his birth. Uh, that is, it doesn't mean that just because he arrived on the scene first out of the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, that doesn't make him the firstborn. The firstborn was a rank and a dignity that was put upon him by his father. It ordinarily went to the oldest son. But it was still the father's prerogative to put it upon any son he desired. And if we would take the time, which I'm not going to do, I can show you three or four examples, clear examples in the Old Testament, where the firstborn, that is by accident of birth, did not become the firstborn by rank and dignity. Reuben is a classic example who had his birthright taken from him. And it was divided up to his children, to his two sons. So the right to be the firstborn didn't necessarily mean he was born first. But the rights and privileges of the firstborn were bestowed upon the son of the father's choice. It was a tremendous privilege and honor. The word birthright in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew both is a plural word. So it's really the birthrights. There were rights and privileges went with this honor and dignity of becoming the firstborn in the family. One of the first rights of the firstborn was authority. Now listen to this, please, I beg you. The firstborn son, or the man upon whom the rights of the firstborn were given, represented not only the family, he represented the father. Next to the father, he was the head of that household. It may not be important to you, but these households numbered into the dozens due to the fact that the sons brought their wives in and they became subject to the father or to the firstborn. And the firstborn became the sole authority in the family. He became the Lord over all others. Next to the father, his word was final. And he wore on his hand the signet ring of his father. And the signet ring was the seal. The family seal. He was in charge of the business. He could write the checks. So this was the first thing, this first privilege that went along with the firstborn rights. Was the right of authority. To be a lord in his own house. To be used by the father in the lives of others. Secondly, there was a priestly privilege. He was set aside as a priest for God. Before the law, when the sacrifices were ordered and a, a definite priesthood was established, the head of the household, or the firstborn, was the family priest. He had the privileges of making sacrifices and offerings. No one else could do it, but he could do it. You remember in the story of Job, how every morning Job got up and the first thing he did was make sacrifices for all of his Sons and daughters, remember that? Oh, it wasn't that they were just irreligious and irresponsible, and so they said, hey, Job, how about shooting up a few prayers for him in the morning? No, it wasn't that. He was the priest. And every morning, his first duty in life was his responsibility to others in his household. And so every morning he got up and he went to the altar, and there he laid his sacrifices in order and offered them to God in behalf of those who depended on him. And then the, the third right which belonged to the firstborn and which was Esau's by choice 
was that he always received a double portion of the father's inheritance. That is, when the father died and the estate was finally divided up, he always received an extra portion for himself because of this tremendous privilege that belonged to him as the firstborn. Now, what does it all mean to me and to you? But we're told in the scriptures that we now are the firstborn of the Father. The rights of the firstborn and the privileges of the firstborn belong to us. Now, all these rights once belonged to Jesus. He was the only Son God the Father had. The only begotten Son, he was called, in whom God was well pleased. And, and this, this great privilege of being the firstborn of God not of some earthly man, but of God, was the Lord Jesus right. He was the one who had sole authority and sole power. He created all things in the exercise of his rights as the firstborn, and he is called in the Colossian letter the firstborn of the whole creation. He has always worn the signet ring of God himself. All the powers and all of the capabilities and all of the attributes and all of the ministries of God are in the sole authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said so when he went back to heaven to have that same glory he had always had. He said that all power in heaven and earth was committed to him. And Paul said that everything in this universal creation is now holding together and hanging together by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also is heaven's only priest. After the order of Melchizedek, with, with the privilege and the opportunity of making sacrifices that no one else can make. Having already made the sacrifice of his own precious blood at the right hand of God. And now interceding for us. But he also has the double portion of the Father's inheritance, even beyond the double portion, the entire inheritance is his. <laughs> And the right of the firstborn <laughs> is what he gave away at the cross of Calvary. And he gave it to you. And he gave it to me. You, do you follow me? That's what he gave you. Oh, you thought he gave you life so you could get to heaven. That's a child's view of it. This is a man's view of it. He gave us the rights of the firstborn so that now we are called even the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. That is, God has our names written down and we are written down as the firstborn of God. And all of these privileges, these honors, these dignities, which was once upon the Lord Jesus Christ, have passed upon us. What about the unsearchable riches of Christ? Have we not received already the double portion of his inheritance? And don't we have the priestly ministry given to us? What does Peter say? He says, you are a kingdom of priests. What does John say when on the Isle of Patmos he says, God, praise to God, he says, and glory and power and honor. He says, why, this one who sits upon the throne, the Lord Jesus, said, He hath made us kings and priests unto God and to His Father. And Peter again, writing to the Christians of his time, said that we were priests. He said we had the unspeakable privilege of offering up spiritual sacrifices to God by Jesus Christ and having those sacrifices accepted. And we do have authority. Sin no longer has power over us. The sin nature no more rules over us as a despot. <clears throat> we have power over Satan. We have power over the flesh and we have most of all power over the world itself. These rights and privileges belong to us. See that none of us despise that birthright. To despise means to look down your nose at it. That's the literal interpretation of the Hebrew word for it. To look down one's nose. Now, if I said to you, well, he kind of looked down his nose at me. You know what I mean, don't you? You'd say he kind of belittled you. 
he kind of uh, looked upon you with condensation. He put some inferiority upon you. He didn't value you and esteem you as he should have. Esau despised this birthright he had, and he lost it. Now, my way to tell you, he lost the rights to the firstborn. He didn't lose his sonship. Isaac didn't say to him, Thou art no longer my son. He lost the privileges that were his. He didn't lose his sonship. Isaac was as sorrowful as Esau was over the fact that he could not give to him the blessing he wanted to give him. It didn't change their relationship. But the change that came brought Esau an eternal loss. We can lose our privileges and rights of the firstborn, but not our sonship. There isn't any way for the Christian to be lost. First of all, did I find myself? Jesus found me. Do you know where I was in 1948? Well, I was wandering around a poor, lost sheep. I couldn't even spell sheep. I didn't know I was lost. If you'd asked me, are you lost? I'd have said, I don't know. What's found? I didn't know who I was or where I was or what I was. And it was Jesus, the shepherd. He began to pursue me. I noticed it long before he apprehended me that there was someone following me. He followed me with goodness and mercy all the days of my life. He pursued me like a detective assigned to a case. And I'm so thankful that he never quit until he brought me to himself. And Paul described his own salvation as being apprehended by the Lord. And then he said, my great desire is to be is to apprehend that for which I was apprehended. And that is to know him and to share in the fellowship of his suffering and to be conformed to his likeness. It was Jesus that found me. I didn't find him. Now, I thought for a little while after I got saved that I'd found him. But he found me. He's the shepherd. He came out there and found me and put me on his shoulder. And he said, I'll take you to my father's house. And when I get there, I'll call my friends together and they'll all rejoice with me that I found you. But he didn't say, now there's the father's house over yonder, about 700 kilometers. There's foxes, wolves, and bears out there. If you can make it through, I'll meet you there. That's what the Christian world is taught in almost all of the church businesses I've ever been in. He found me. He's the shepherd. He placed me upon his shoulder. He's going to take me to his father's house. If I get lost between here and there, it will be his fault. He's the shepherd. No Christian can lose his sonship. When I was saved, I was born in the family of God. God is my father. I'm his son. I have five sons of my own. They're not all obedient. They don't all please me. They're not all submitted to me in the way that I wish they were. Most of the time... They lack so much to be the perfect son. But they're my sons. And it's my blood that's in their veins. It's my nature that's in them. And I can't deny that and they can't deny it. I covet for them a better relationship. I'd like to see changes in their lives. If I were a perfect father which I'm not, then I would say I'd like to see them conformed to my very own image. I'd like for them to all grow up and be just like me. And in the sense that I know Jesus, I wish they would all grow up to be like me. Okay, but nothing's nothing's changed in our relationship as father and son, no matter what comes out. I just heard this. I want to pass it on to you. Don't even know whether it fits here, but it's bugging me, okay? 
they were they were having a, a panel discussion down in Dallas a few weeks ago. I was talking to my brother on the phone last night. He passed this on to me. And in this in this uh, panel discussion, the subject was the Christian home. And uh, the man who is not only a very earnest Bible student, but is also a psychiatrist on the side. Whatever connection that has, I don't know. But he happened to be present, and, and one of the pastors got up, and he preached on the happiness of the Christian home. And he was telling ways from the Scripture how to make your Christian home a happy home. And he said he thought if the Christian home was what it ought to be, that that's the way it would be known. It would be a happy home. And then his brother said, well, I'd like to speak on the other side of that. And he said something that really blessed my heart. He said, a Christian home isn't necessarily a happy home. And they said, oh, what do you mean by that? Well, he said, a Christian home is made up of many things. First of all, there are many people in it. Secondly, our lives are not just made up of happiness. They're made up of sorrow and grief and tears and disappointment and heartache and problems that can't be solved and questions that don't have answers. And there's friction. And there's disagreement. All of these things are a part of the Christian home. And he said happiness is not measured by the fact that everybody goes around with a smile on their face. He said happiness could be the same as success. And he said now you can have a successful Christian home, but you can't have a happy one. And a successful Christian home is where the members of that Christian home meet the problems as they come up, cope with the sorrows and the griefs as they come along, and somehow through it all manage to love Jesus and one another. You agree with that? Very good. Thank you, Doctor. What am I saying this for? Well, I'm saying this. Christian life isn't a happy life. Happiness and Christianity are not synonymous. They're not even compatible. And I'll tell you why they're not. Because happiness belongs to the flesh. And the name of the Christian game is keep the flesh unhappy. And you may not work at it too much, but the Holy Spirit works at it every day of your life. And His ministry in me is to continually suppress the flesh. Galatians says that there is conflict. It says that the Spirit is daily striving, agonizing against the power of the flesh in me. And when the Spirit is successful, as He always is, he keeps the flesh in a continual state of unhappiness. Have I bent your minds out of shape too much? Okay. This might help you, especially, you know, if somebody says you're an old, long-faced Christian. Well, listen, uh, being a Christian is a very serious business. And it really isn't too much to laugh about. So, I don't know how to tell you that the Christian exists excepting to tell you that he's kind of joyful in his unhappiness. <laughs> Does that describe him? Joyful in his unhappiness. As one man expressed it to me many years ago, I'm, I'm crying on the outside but I'm laughing on the inside. And sometimes it gets turned around. We laugh on the outside and cry on the inside. And I do more of that than I do the other. So, this thing here with Esau, it didn't, it didn't have anything to do with his relationship to the father, and it didn't have anything to do with his relationship in the family. And uh, since we're now finished with this illusion of a, of a Christian home being a happy home, or a Christian life being a happy life, then in spite of the unhappiness that was in Esau's home and in Esau's life, nothing changed. He was still Isaac's son, and he would be until the day he died, the only thing that had changed was that he had despised and looked down his nose at the most precious privilege he had in life. And now, at the end of the road, he's sorry. And he weeps bitterly and openly over the foolish choice that he made. But the choice was his. 
Now, how in the world could a man do that? You listening? You going to stay till I finish this morning? I'm going to get done at 1 o'clock. How could a man do that? Can a man call God like Esau turn away from his birthright? Demas did. Demas was a Christian. John Mark did. He was a Christian. He got homesick and he just ran off and left Paul and said, I'm going home. Paul says, go home, but don't ever come back. And that's what the big fracas was between him and, and Barnabas. Peter did. Talk about a man called of God. Peter, chief, not less than chief, but chief of the apostles. A man singled out from <clears throat> among all the disciples that followed Jesus. And, and Jesus delivered to this man more responsibility than any man who walked on the face of the earth until the apostle Paul. He gave to him the keys to the kingdom, whatever that is. But when you carry the keys, you've got to be somehow a big shot. And Peter had the keys. Here was a man called. This man, I'm going to preach on Simon Peter in, in, the, in the future, if we're still here. I'm going to tell you the story of his life. He was a rich man. He had fishing vessels, commercial vessels. He had men working for him. He was a successful fisherman and a successful Christian businessman. Until one Jesus, day Jesus made a claim on his life far above and beyond the call of duty. He said, leave it all. Leave it all and follow me. Let somebody else fish. Somebody else make the money. Somebody else be successful. You come after me. I'll make you a fisher of men. How's that grab you? Peter said, I go. And he just threw everything down and he went. Had he been able to see ahead, he never would have gone. He just said, I don't think so. <laughs> but he just threw the nets down. He said, I'm going. And he went. But after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead, Peter was so discouraged and he was so disappointed in the way the ministry had turned out. And I know exactly what bothered the heart of Peter down inside was that he was a little tired of the responsibility. And one day, and I'm not, I'm not reading anything into the Scriptures because it's all here. The words in the Greek will tell you this if you'll take the time to study them. One day Peter said to his other brethren, I quit. You fellows go on. Follow Jesus. I don't want to discourage any of you. I don't want to stand in your way. I don't want to be any hindrance to you. I don't want to be any stumbling block. You just go ahead and live for Jesus, but I quit. What are you going to do? I'm going to go back to fish. And he got his ships out again. And The strange thing was, when he went to get himself a crew, he found out that his whole crew were made up of his own brothers in Jesus. Into whose heart Peter's discouragement had crept. And his trouble had come and his defilement had reached. And they said, we'll go with you. We'll all quit. And we'll go to sea and we'll never come back again. You can do that. If there's a ship sails for Tarsus every hour. The passage is free. You can go any time you want to get on the ship. You may have to come back by submarine like Jonah did. But you can go. If you fancy coming back and being vomited out on the shore, a nice way to return, you can go. You may go first class, but you will come back tourists, believe me. <laughs> and the fishing ship is always leaving. There will always be Peter and his friends that will take you along if you want to go. And you can go, but you will fish all night and you catch nothing. That simply means that whatever it is you give yourself to will be empty. There won't be anything there. You agree to that? No. And sooner or later, when you find out that there's nothing there, you have to come back. And then when you come back, you come back naked, like Peter did. You come back to Jesus. That's where you come back to. And he says, now, let's talk about whether you love me or not. Peter says, there isn't anything to talk about. Okay, then let's get on with following me. And he did. How could a man do a thing like Esau did? Peter did. 
But it wasn't for long and he came back. How could Esau, how could Esau have sold, how could he have sold his birthright? Well, for a moment, just for a moment, <laughs> that bowl of chili looked better to him than all the pie in the sky promised. <laughs> and when you're tired and you're hungry, and there's a steaming bowl of chili sitting there, you can have a pretty big tug on you, you know. And he kept looking at that bowl of chili and kept looking at it, and finally he said, Oh, what's a birthright worth to me now? I'm dying. Give me the soup. Take your birthright. I'll worry about that afterward. So for a moment, the material gain seemed greater to him than the spiritual gain. The present enjoyment seemed much more important to him than the eternal enjoyment. The pleasure of sin for a season was much more attractive and the, repro the reproof and the rebuke and the reproach of Christ. And so he just kind of looked down his nose at the birthright. He kind of slighted it. He kind of said, oh, what's it worth anyway now at this present moment? Well, now, I have another question. I said, how could Esau have done it? I had, my second question is, how could Esau do it? <laughs> that sounds like my first question, doesn't it? That is, what kind of mysticism <laughs> came over Esau's heart? What, what kind of magic power got a hold of Esau's mind? Well, there were two things I think contributed to it. And, and the first thing was, number one, the devil. You don't believe in the devil, maybe. I believe in the devil. It's because I'm so personally well acquainted with him. And the devil only has, I've been telling you, one weapon. And that weapon is in his power and in his ability to deceive. So he deceived Esau. The devil said, let me tell you about that bowl of chili. Man. Esau, tell me, about, tell me about that bowl of chili. Well, what's about it? Well, it's really good. <laughs> is that right? Well, I'm really hungry too, you know. Well, why don't you try it? You like it. <laughs> and if you don't, there's always Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> oh come on devil do you think <laughs> oh wait a minute do you think I should throw away a birthright for bowl of chili well let's look at it this way Esau <laughs> you die from hunger <laughs> you're not going to worry too much about the birthright <laughs> I want that chili <clears throat> and you know the, his conversation with Jacob was one of the few jokes that's ever recorded in the Bible we have reason to believe that Esau was a red haired man and uh, that, was his, that was the name that was applied to him, the red man. And he made this little joke, and, and it can't even be translated into English, and it won't be. You know, you can't translate puns. So this was the pun that he made, was to Jacob, he said, how about giving old red some of that red? And he was referring to the soup. And he said, well... What do you give me for it? Esau says, what do you want? He said, well, I've been thinking about it. Why don't you give me your birthright? A birthright? For a bowl of chili? Oh, you're dying. <laughs> don't have that too bad a shake, is it? <laughs> you're going to die without this chili. You can't make it without this chili. Your desire <clears throat> for this material thing or this fleshly thing here is too great. <coughs> You're not going to be able to make it without it. You've got to have it. Give me the birthright. Oh, he said, okay. What's the birthright to me when I'm dying? But before Jacob gave him the soup, this is pretty good. You pay in advance. Swear to me. He said, all right, I swear. The birthright's yours. Enjoy your soup, Esau, big dummy. So he sold his birthright. There was another factor. Hear the factor well. The devil deceived him. How could the devil deceive him? Why would he even listen to the devil? Why didn't he say to the devil, Look, well, talk to me about this. I want that birthright. I know the privileges connected with that birthright. I'm going to have it. Now leave me alone. The devil would have left him alone. What well, made him listen to him to start with? Well, he listened because he was tired. That's what the scripture said. 
he was tired. He came in out of the field and he was a tired man and he was all worn out. He said, look, I'm too tired to argue. The soup right now looks greater to me than the birthright. I know I may regret it tomorrow. But the devil has a word. It's a real powerful word. It's a little word now. And he says now is the thing. Tomorrow it doesn't exist. Now is the thing. Oh, your birthright will be worth something to you someday. Look at Isaac. He might live to be 290 years old. He'll never die. And uh, you'll never get the birthright. And anyway, listen to this very carefully. I can sell the birthright for the pleasures of sin now for this season. And then, if it does turn out that my father denies me the blessing of the birthright, I will shed some tears and he will feel sorry for me. And he will say, forget the whole thing. Okay? It's another one of Satan's lies. He told me that when I was a little boy. I used to think about all the bad things I did. <laughs> and my comfort was this. Well, I'm not going to worry about it because when I see God, i got two things going for me. I'm going to cry. I'm going to talk him out of it. <laughs> And when I was a little boy, I really thought I could do that. I thought if I cried, I could talk him out. Now, who taught me that? You did, Mother. <laughs> now, you didn't tell me what the Bible taught. You just taught me that by experience. Because I don't ever remember a time that I didn't cry and talk, and you didn't listen. <laughs> and you always ended up saying, all right, go do it. Or, okay, forget it. Don't teach your children that that it can have some kind of bad effect on them. And the devil tells every Christian that. Now, he, he doesn't tell me, you know, uh, the same thing in regards to going to hell or getting to heaven, but he does tell me this about my life. And he says, now is the thing. And he says, anyway, anyway, you've been a, you've been a good son. Have your mess of pottage. And then uh, cry a little when you see the Lord and tell Him how sorry you are. And He'll say, it's okay. I forgive you. Oh, He'll forgive me. He's already forgiven me every one of my sins and my iniquities and my transgressions. But Jesus loves me. He wants what only love can give Him. This birthright, He died that I might have. It, it just wasn't something he kept me safe deposit box, you know. And he said, well, I can do without this. I'm going to give it to him. This is something he came all the way from heaven and went all the way to hell to give me. How could Esau do it? Well, he got tired and he lost uh, his argument with the devil and he got to looking at the word now and this present moment of time and you know, there was a terrible afterward in all of this because one day Esau had to come in and he had to face his dying father. And this was the very hour that the birthright was to be placed upon the son with all of his blessing. And he came into his father's dying bedside and he said, Bless me now, my father. He said, I can't. Why? I'm your son. You love me. I know it says Isaac loved Esau. But I can't. Why can't you, Father? Because I took your birthright and I gave it to your brother. The privileges you had are no longer yours. I've given them to another. And Esau, willing to settle for half a loaf if he can't get a hole, says, well, then bless me with some blessing, my father. Can't you, can't you find just one blessing for me? And he did this very tearfully, the scripture says. He wept bitterly over this loss. And his father said, I wish I could, but I can't. So when the statement is made that 
there was no place of repentance found, though he sought it carefully with tears, doesn't mean that Esau couldn't repent. Esau did repent. His tears were evidence enough of his repentance. Broken and contrite heart, thou wilt not despise, O God. And Esau had repented. He was broken up in repentance. But the place of repentance he couldn't find was in his father's heart. His father couldn't repent of what he had done. His father could not change his mind about the fact that he had already given the blessing to Jacob. In other words, what the tears were all about was the realization on Esau's part that by one moment of foolishness in his life, he had given away forever the spiritual blessings that was a gift of God to him. And the Bible says that he was rejected. Does that mean he went to hell? <laughs> no. It means that he was counted unworthy for the prize. It means that he was set aside in favor of another when the blessings were handed out. I'd like to believe, Esau would like to believe, you would like to believe, that if we fail of the grace of God, and we quit running the race, and we turn away and say, heaven's enough, let the crowns be for somebody else. You would like to believe, and Esau would like to have believed, and I would like to believe, that we can't really be blamed for what happened because of the circumstances. After all, wasn't Esau tired? Wasn't he hungry? Wasn't he in need? And didn't he have as much right to have those needs met as anybody else? And didn't he have the right to choose that pottage for now instead of a blessing for later if he wanted to? Yes, the responsibility was his. And I'm going to tell you, two little verses of Scripture came together in my heart this morning. And Adam threw away the whole human race. And you know the circumstances that surrounded him? Perfect paradise. And in the midst of a perfect paradise, he threw it all away. Yet in the book of Revelation, in the third chapter, when Jesus talks to the churches in Asia, he mentions one church, he said, who lived where Satan's throne was. But he said of them, Thou hast not denied me, and thou hast kept the faith. Now you see those two contradictory things? Here's one Christian, we'll say, who threw it all the way in the midst of paradise. Circumstance didn't have anything to do with the fact that he willfully wanted what didn't belong to him and took it and despised the birthright and threw away a God-given privilege. Yet here were other Christians, Jesus said, who lived in the presence of the very throne of the devil himself and did so with faith and never denied his name. And their circumstances didn't have a thing to do with their success, nor did Adam's circumstances have a thing to do with his failure. The difference was that one availed themselves of the grace of God and one wouldn't. What are you doing with your life? Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we can only thank you for what you've said to us here this morning and perhaps if we're still here on Wednesday and we are able to go to this next message and able to see something not only of the place to which we are now passing at Mount Zion at heavenly Jerusalem but to see something of what's there and who's there Maybe we'll make out better than Esau and we pray that the lesson of Esau will be burned upon our hearts and that we'll be able to see even through our tears the sweet reasonableness of the Spirit of God. And Father, we just pray that each of us might learn through the folly of this man that long after the mess of pottage is gone, Jesus will be real and eternity will be real. And what we've done with our life will be important. Help us to spend it for Jesus in a way that would glorify Him 
and bring honor to Thee. And in His precious name we pray, for His sake. Amen. Lord bless you.